Jonathan Palland has a knack for bringing that retro feel back with embedded rust code on a Cortex-M node. I would say that's a glorious hack. All right, thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, I'm talking about uh, Monotron, my attempt to pretend I'm not quite as old as, uh, as I actually am. Uh, so, very good question, why? So this is an embedded Rust project. Embedded Rust is cool. You should all do more embedded Rust. Uh, I am an embedded C programmer by trade. Uh, I work in Cambridge at a company called Cambridge Consultants. And I don't get to do enough embedded programming at work. I mean, it's literally my whole day at work, but it's not enough. So I come home and I do more at home. Um, I have tried some embedded C++. We have long, engaging discussions at lunch breaks over the values of C versus C++. Um, it, it's not for me. Uh, I've tried it. Um, at, at work, we mainly stick to C, but I'm trying to convince people that embedded Rust is the answer. Because it fixes all of my problems, right? I've got docs, a built-in doc generator, built-in build system, tests, package manager, memory safety. It's amazing. It, it, it is an, an excellent solution when you're trying to build small embedded devices like modems or Bluetooth headsets, and you're, you're in a hurry. So one of the things I take part in, because um, clearly I have vast amounts of <laughs> spare time, uh, is the embedded working group. So Jorge's out there somewhere. Jorge heads up the... Uh, the embedded working group. There's a bunch of us get together and talk about what the future of Rust is like on embedded systems. And I'm happy to say, it looks like by the end of this year, by Rust 2018 edition, you will be able to build embedded code for a Cortex-M ARM processor and a bunch of others using the stable Rust compiler. No more doing Rust up update and rolling the dice. <laughs> it's good news. Seriously, the number of times I've rolled the Rust up update dice and everything's broken. So why this particular project? Well, I like the 80s. Uh, systems were much simpler. Computers like the, the VIC-20 and the, the Commodore 64 the, that I had, uh, if it all goes wrong, you turn it off, turn it on again, and everything is back to factory settings. Um, I like, I like working on bare metal, you know, libraries and things that help you do stuff are interesting, but I'm quite interested in getting down to the, to the guts. I want to understand what the processor is doing and why it's doing what it's doing. So that's what, that's what interests me. Um, and it turns out I don't seem to watch any TV these days because I'm far too busy watching YouTube. Fine selection of retro YouTube channels. I recommend you check them all out because they're all marvelous. So this particular project, can we make some sort of retro 80 style, 8-bit style computer in embedded Rust? Um, well, I like the challenge. Um, there's, there's a saying that there's a certain amount of beauty comes from constraints. Right? It's easier to, it's easier to perhaps design a beautiful um, urban garden when you have a very small parcel of land than it is to try and do a beautiful landscape when you've got 300 acres to work with. Being constrained can bring out beauty in a, in a solution, I think. And I, literally, when I started this project, I had no idea if what I wanted to do was even possible. Can you make a computer out of just a small, cheap, embedded microcontroller, basically with the junk I had lying on my desk anyway? Um, how, and how much, how much can we make it do? How far can we, uh, can we push this? So, what have I done? Well, the goals for this project, so I had to do something that cost very little, don't have a lot of money, I just have junk on my desk. I want to write it in Rust, and that basically limits you to some of the Cortex-M cores from, from ARM, also based in Cambridge. Uh, for those of you who don't know, ARM sell processor cores, but you don't just buy a Cortex-M3, you buy a chip from Texas Instruments or um, one of the other manufacturers, ST Micro, and they give you the ARM core and a whole bunch of peripherals around it. In the olden days, this was what was on your motherboard, a processor, a serial port, you know, maybe a video controller, maybe a sound controller, but now they all come on, on one chip. Um, and they're incredibly cheap. You can, you can get some of the basic ones for, for literally pennies. 
They're very low power, but I didn't want to use a platform that had lots of built-in peripherals, because built-in peripherals are cheating. We're supposed to do this the hard way to try and understand these constraints. So, you know, things with video generators, well, that's just no fun. So this was the first platform I looked at, the, uh, the ST-Micro F7 Discovery. Uh, it's got a megabyte of flash, 340K of SRAM. Um, this board retails for about 50 pounds, or about $50, because everything in Britain's expensive. But it comes with a proper um, LCD interface, and you could probably just wire up a, a monitor and have full color output pretty trivially uh, with audio and Ethernet and memory cards. And well, frankly, that is cheating. That is far too much working out of the box. Someone's already written some Rust software, so most of this stuff already works. No fun at all. This is what it looks like. <laughs> so the, uh, the board I use is the Stellaris Launchpad from Texas Instruments. You get 256K of flash and 32K of RAM. Uh, it's clocked it up to 80 megahertz. And because I've been working with these for a little while, I have some, some board support crates. I kind of know how to start the processor. The ones I did originally, they're not great. There was a lot, of, um, a lot of difference of opinion in the embedded Rust community. Every time someone supported a new chip, they did it differently. But now we've started to work out, you know, there's a consistent way to do this that, that allows these things to feel the same, look more similar. So this was a, an exercise in testing out some of those things. Um, and I've got some very simple peripherals. Uh, SPI is basically just a one-bit digital output you can turn on and off at quite high speed. We've got serial ports, uh, UARTs, and uh, a thing called PWM, pulse width modulation. This is basically an autonomous um, waveform you can generate from the process. It's on for a period of time and then off for a period of time. It's just like a blinking light, on, off, on, off. And you get to choose how long it's on and how long it's off and everything else happens by magic. But there's literally nothing else on there that's of use to me. So we're going to have to roll our sleeves up to do this. This is what the board looks like. Um, if you're interested later, I've, I've got one with me. You can, you can have a little look, see what it looks like with all the wires on. So how are we doing this? Well, this is the, uh, this is the chip. And I apologize for failing to respect uh, margins in my Google presentation. Um, but basically, we've got. Uh, a DMA engine, this is a piece of silicon baked into the chip that can automatically move memory from somewhere to somewhere else. And you can get off and do a different, you can execute some code while that's happening in the background. Maybe useful. Uh, we have some timers on there. Uh, these are the devices that generate those PWM signals. So they can either do on, off, on, off in cycles, or they can, they can wait a period of time. And when the time expires, an alarm goes off and your CPU is interrupted and can go and do some work. Um, and it, it can run at a speed of 66.67 or, or 80 megahertz. And we'll see if that's uh, relevant. Now, the, uh, some of the great work Jorge's been doing um, and others is this tool called SVD to Rust. And what an SVD is, it's basically a description of the chip provided by the manufacturer. The way these chips work is all of their peripherals uh, exist at magic memory addresses that aren't really memory, they're chip peripheral. And this file describes them all. So instead of having to write thousands of lines of code, like I did on my first project, the code is auto-generated. And there are just UART objects, serial port objects, that you can use. Or here we can, we've got the runtime clock control module, and we are modifying the uh, the Amber H bus enable register, and we're modifying it to turn on the IOP enable bit. Um, but in C, this would look like star some number or equals some other number. And you're like, well, unless you've memorized the data sheet, that is of no use whatsoever. I admit that is relatively unreadable to some people, but if you understand the chip and you understand that there is an IOP enable bit, in the AHB enable register, then that becomes a lot more readable. And actually, the compiler just turns that into set this bit in this memory location. So although there's more typing, it doesn't cost you anything at runtime. It's just as fast as doing it the old-fashioned way, which I think is just brilliant. Uh, who listens to New Rust Station, the podcast? It's a brilliant podcast. Crates you should know. Here's my list of crates you should know. Uh, SVD to Rust. 
generates a crate for each supported chip. The TM is the, the TI chip I've got on mine. There's an STM chip there. But these are fairly low-level APIs, as, you, as you've seen. So we wrapped them up in something a little higher level. These HAL crates describe the various types of peripherals in a common fashion. So there's one for the chip I'm using, one for the STM. Um, but they use these embedded HAL traits. And basically, if you write your code to use a UART, then you should be able to plug in any of these chip crates and use any UART from any of these chips. And it helps people write reusable libraries that will run on a number of embedded platforms. Again, it's quite difficult to do in C. Though for this specific um, case of a Cortex-M, then there are a couple of Cortex-M helper crates. Again, Jorge's done great work on those. Uh, one to sort of managing the chip, and one RTs the runtime. So that's for getting the chip booted. So there was a bunch of stuff I didn't have to do. So video signals, how ironic that my presentation about video is falling off the edge of the screen. So this is old-fashioned VGA video. You might remember the little blue connectors on the back of your PC with 15 pins. Well, it's an analog video signal, and it involves the three standard analog colors, red, green, and blue. And these are analog signals that vary between 0 and 0 0.7 volts. And the amount of voltage you put on each of those colored pins controls how bright the screen is in that particular color. And so the signals uh, on the screen start on the left and go to the right, and that is time. So the left-hand edge of the screen is this edge on the left, and the right-hand edge of the screen is here. Except, of course, in my case, I think the edge of the projector is probably about here, which is why you're, you're missing the left-hand side of the screen. The, uh, the black line at the top, this is called the sync pulse. So this helps the monitor find the edge of the screen. So the sync pulse goes low for a period of time, and then it goes high, and you get this little gap called the back porch, and then we have the data, our visible data, and ordinarily these lines would wiggle up and down. If they're flat like that, then that's a plain white screen, because every pixel is maximum on all three colors. And then there's a sort of a, a gap at the end called the front porch. And this just happens around, 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 again and again and again. Each of those lines stacks up, and we have a certain number of lines in a frame, 600, 480, whatever it is. And the frames, again, just repeat, repeat. And there's a special uh, sync pulse called the vertical sync, which tells you which line you are within a frame. So we have a horizontal sync that says where you are within your line, and a vertical sync says where you are within your frame. And again, there's some blank lines. The sync pulse goes low, some more blank lines, and then these blue lines are where the, where the picture is. So it's, it's kind of straightforward, and you can kind of start to see where these timer peripherals might be useful to generate these sort of repeated on-off signals. I've lost my mouse cursor. So timing is incredibly important. If you get the timing wrong, your monitor will tell you to go away. My monitor has told me to go away on a very large number of occasions. It's taken a while to get this to work. It's all about this thing called the pixel clock. The pixels must change repeatedly and reliably, and each pixel must be exactly the right length in time. And if they're not, the monitor will get confused, and the pixels will start to look very strange. And the, the timing basically comes from the resolution you choose, right? So there's a pixels across, lines down, 640 pixels across, times 480 lines high, 60 frames per second. This is the good old-fashioned IBM standard. And that means you need to be generating new pixels every, well, you need 25.175 million pixels per second. This is quite a large number for, for small embedded chips. It also does not divide down nicely into 66.7 or 80. Um, so that's not going to work. Uh, so the other one, when you turn on your old-fashioned PC and you get the BIOS screen comes up and it makes the beep sound, uh, you know, press delete to enter setup, well, that used to be at a resolution of 720 by 400 at 70 hertz. That's just how the numbers worked out when IBM developed it. 28.322 megahertz. 
that's not going to work either, which is a shame because it would have a great sort of IBM classic retro feel. 800 by 600 at 60 hertz. Well, that's sort of a, a resolution you were using in Windows 95, Windows 3.1. It feels kind of retro. 40.000 megahertz. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a winner. I can just take my 80 megahertz processor clock, divide it by two, and there's the pixel clock I need to generate this data. So the maths stacks up. So what do we end up with? Well, 800 by 600, 40 megahertz clock, done. Turns out 800 horizontal pixels is too many. I don't have enough processor time to generate that many, but I've got a plan. If I make my pixels twice as long and send half as many, the monitor will have no idea I've done this. It will see two pixels when I've only sent one. So we can do it 400 by 600, and the monitor has no idea, and that will work. If we then divide the screen into characters, eight pixels across, 16 pixels high, that's sort of a good old-fashioned DOS-style font, then we get about 48 by 36. Doesn't divide evenly, we put a border on. 12 pixels top and bottom, eight on the side, makes it feel like a Commodore 64, um, and helpfully makes some of the math simpler, as it turns out. And then the idea is, we can load these pixels into our, into our digital output, our SPI peripheral, synchronous peripheral interface. Basically, I can load bytes in, 8-bit values, and single bits will magically appear. So my processor can put an 8-bit value in, and then go off and do something else, and the 8 bits will be generated at, uh, well, in my case, 20 megahertz to get my double width pixels automatically. And even better, this particular chip has what's called a, a FIFO, a first in, first out queue. I can load 16 bytes up and then go away, and the chip will generate 8 bits for each of those 16 bytes completely all by itself. It was never designed to do video. It was designed to talk to modems and, and memory chips and SD cards. SPI, incidentally, is exactly how SD cards uh, work in their basic mode. So how do we do this in software terms? Well, we have our pixels, and we can divide our line up into discrete pixels. I can turn on and off. Um, I don't really have any sense of brightness. There aren't scales of gray here. either. The output is maximum on or maximum off. And so what we do is we set up some timer interrupts. And at the beginning of the line, the start of this sync pulse, and when the sync pulse goes low, a timer interrupt fires, and we execute some code. And what we do is we get the line set up. What line am I on? Well, that's one more than the one I was last time. If I get to 628, then I'm at the bottom, and I need to go back around to the top again. And I can start filling my SPI FIFO, and then Right about here, when I expect the data to start, my pixels to start being generated, I can fire a second interrupt, and I can... Basically, it, my SPI FIFO is like a bath. The first interrupt, I fill my bath. On the second interrupt, I pull the plug. And I can't quite fill my bath fast enough, but that's fine because I've had a bit of a head start. And hopefully, by the end of the line, the very last uh, bit of pixel data drains out of my bath just as I'm pouring it in, and everything will work. And I have to do that 628 times a, uh, times a frame, 60 frames a second. Um, it's best not to think about how much work this processor is doing, because you start to question what's happening. So this is the magic number. If I have an 80 megahertz processor clock, and I'm dividing it down with a 20 megahertz pixel clock, and I have to output these eight bits for my every character, Basically, what happens is I have 32 clock cycles of my processor. I can perform about 32 instructions in my processor for every character across my screen. I have to go to the character buffer, find out what letter is being displayed, a letter A, work out where I am in the letter. I'm in the middle, maybe across the bar of the letter A. Work out which bits need to be on and off. Well, there's some off at the edge, and there's maybe a line in the middle. I have to work out if there's any coloring or other stuff going on, and then I have to get that into the output register for my SPI peripheral, 
and I've got to do that in 32 clock cycles or less. If you get it wrong, you get a mess. If you get it right, you get something like this. So, this is actually uh, the font from FreeBSD. If you boot FreeBSD on a Spark machine or something that doesn't have a VGA video card, they use this exact font. And we can see here I'm generating green text on a black background. I'm just waggling the green pin out of my red, green, blue. Um, at this point, can't manage red and blue. But, it, you know, it's a solid picture. It goes fuzzy in the corner, but that is my appalling ability to use my Canon SLR as opposed to the, the quality of the video. If you look at it in the real thing, it looks fine. In fact, looks a bit like this. Ta-da! <laughs> and uh, the very observant of you will spot that it is no longer green on black. <laughs> it is now, in fact, white on blue. There are some shortcuts you can take when it comes to generating color video. If you want to generate white on blue, then for every pixel that is set, then you need to put a one in the red, the green, and the blue. And for every background pixel, you just need the blue on, and the red and the green are blank. So if I have my 8-bit value, then basically what I need to do is put my 8-bit value in the red and in the green, and then always put eight ones in the blue channel, and this happens. So basically, there's no more work to do, and I can just drive the three channels. And this was as far as I got. And if you've, if you've seen what I've been doing on Twitter, this has been just driving me, driving me uh, wild trying to get this sorted. Let's see if I can get the serial terminal going. So uh, I am going to implement keyboard support. I do have an old Dell keyboard, but for now, I have a menu system. So there's a serial port. So you can send it commands. And you can do things like, if you want to see how this chip boots, dump uh, hex 100 bytes at address 0. For the uh, terminally curious, the this value here is the, the stack pointer. And then these values are my interrupt vectors. And you notice all my all interrupt vectors are the same. They pointed an interrupt vector that says, I haven't written this, this, this yet. You need to crash. So basically, the function at address 0, these addresses are backwards, little endian. I think you've got Intel to thank for that. Uh, the address 0000177F is the interrupt vector that says crash. Hilariously, these monitors down here now look exactly like a Windows blue screen of death. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a, that's a, a scene many people have, uh, have seen before. But you know what? Then enough of this. Let's talk about some art. What can you do with this system? Well, I don't have pixels. If I had a pixel buffer, then I would blow half of my memory storing individual pixels, and there would be no color. So we've got blocks. It's a bit like teletext. But you can imagine, if I put the effort in, this would be a playable game. You know, my kids might enjoy this, right? Space Invaders. That's good. All right, maybe not Space Invaders. How about Pac-Man? I think you're fine. That's full color, ladies and gentlemen. We've got red, green, and blue at the same time. So it turns out there are some more cheats you can take if you are prepared to use vast amounts of flash memory. I don't have enough time to do maths to say, if this character is yellow, then place values here and here and not here. If this value is green, do this other thing. Because the, if it's yellow, if it's green, if it's blue, if it's whatever, takes too long. You can arrange a table in memory and pre-compute values. It basically uses one kilobyte per color, and I have 64 color combinations. So I have eight foreground and eight background. But if you just blow 64 kilobytes of memory, then your color lookup just becomes an index into find the table I want, jump down to the 8-bit value I want. There's my red, green, blue values. And so we have full color. So this is a bit more exciting, right? How about we have a sort of a DOS-style DOS style, uh, productivity application, right? I can, manage, I can manage my life with that. 
And you can imagine mouse support, right? Bear with mouse support, you can drag these windows around. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my youth using Ball and Turbo Pascal 6, and this was the future back when, uh, back when I was a kid. So it, incidentally, typing these into your source code by hand is incredibly slow. So I found a wonderful paint package called Rex Paint, and it is designed to paint these DOS-style pictures. And as I have absolutely no artistic merit, the only other thing I could think to draw while using Rex Paint was a picture of Rex Paint. So this is an ASCII art editor. Again, mine's just a sort of a fictional version. It's an artwork. But you can imagine, you can select the characters. This is my character set. It is, if you're interested, DOS code page 850, for those of you who remember DOS code pages. Basically, Unicode hadn't been invented, um, and so you had a choice. Did you want uh, Central European languages or Western European languages, or were you American and you didn't give a damn about accented letters, in which case you could have lots of boxes uh, and drawing characters. This is, a, this is a combination of the two. We have some accents, we have a few boxes. Um, this is... Uh, the 50% character, which is 50% foreground, 50% background, and it helps get you a few more, a few more colours. But you know, I amuse myself. I drew some, you know, trees and hills and suns and backgrounds. But, um, but let's face it, this project was never going to set the world on fire. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, yeah, I know. Happy, happy to take questions. Are there any questions? I should add, you can find all the, uh, all the code on GitHub. If you go to keybase.io slash the JPster, you, um, you can find all of, the, all of the source code. Okay. Would, oh, okay. Would you accept a pull request to add Space Invaders? Uh, absolutely, please do write software for this, because <laughs> I have no time at all. <laughs> Can you give it just back? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you think this could work on the, um, on the BBC micro bit, or is it too slow? Uh, interesting question. So this... Uh, requires a certain amount of processing power, I'd have to go and look at the specs. But I think the micro bit is another Cortex-M. I'd have to check the exact clock frequencies you can set it to. But maybe you could handle um, PAL video or NTSC analog video or maybe a lower resolution. So it's, it's possible and the crates are portable. So there is a crate that's called VGA frame buffer um, and that just has some plug-in values for the timing and some hardware specific callbacks you can set. So yeah, you could definitely try it on, on some other platforms as well. Please hand back the microphone. Where? Uh, did you need to write any inline assembly to get this to work, or is it all in Rust? Uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a little, you know, just a mm, <laughs> smooch of, uh, of inline assembler, if I'm honest. So it turns out, if you activate your red FIFO, and then in the next machine instruction, you activate your green FIFO, well, the red FIFO has already started sending pixels, and then your red, your green, and your blue don't line up, and you get these sort of weird fringe effects around all of your letters. So the solution, and it took me a while to get to this, is you preload your red FIFO with uh, two 8-bit values that are all zero, and you preload your green with one 8-bit value that's all zeros, and you start your red 16 pixels early, and then you have to put exactly the right number of assembler no operation instructions in. <laughs> and you start the green, and then you have another seven no ops, and then you start the blue, and they are always in sync, perfectly in sync. But you do need that little, just a smoosh of inline assembler. <laughs> Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, we've set up our...